more, more, more. You know, that's kind of a negative word in a lot of ways. You know, when people are asking more of us, we, that's frustrating. I'm giving all I can, I'm doing my best. And when we're asking for more, we're usually being selfish, aren't we? More, give me more, give me more, give me more, give me more. I want more, I want more. Um, it's, it's a negative word in the world. But that's why so many words in the world are. They just become negative. Because the world is net negative. You know what I mean by that? You know what I mean by net negative? <clears throat> if you have a, a, a plus five and a minus six, you have a minus one. That's net negative. Those two together create a negative. There's a lot of positive in the world, but the world itself is net negative. God is all positive. He's all positive. It's all good. And God wants us to see these words as good. Because when you learn that your return on investment with God is the more you give, the more you get, if you really learn that loop, the more you're going to want to give, right? You're going to give a lot. Give more. Give more. I've always been an overachiever. I'm the youngest of a, of a big family um, of eight kids in a very hierarchical family. And we were a country family. We were pretty poor. <clears throat> I, I don't even know where I slept until I was six. I really try to remember where I slept. I didn't have a bed. I just kind of slept around. Uh, so I kind of started out in a really bad way there. But when I was six, I was elevated to get to sleep with two brothers. And um, they scared me to death. Now, we had alligators under our bed. And when we got up, we jumped. And you couldn't, there were alligators under there sometimes because sometimes one of my brothers would be under there. And when I would try to get up, they would grab for me. And I never looked to see it with my brothers uh, because I didn't care. But there were other scary things under our beds because we didn't clean up and it was a boy's room. But nonetheless, we, uh, uh, I lived in a family that was like that. Uh, there were lots of really kind of funny things that went on in a big family. We didn't have a lot. We were pretty poor. Uh, as I said, we lived out in the country. We were all packed into these little spaces. So, we're on the back of a pickup because we had to sometime. Uh, that was our transportation. Uh, it, it was a different world. And as I look back, I was, I was pretty loved. I was pretty loved. But I never felt like it. Matt, blame me. I'm weak. I'm bad. I was a bad kid. I never felt loved. We didn't show affection. Even my mom didn't want to show affection. They came out of an old generation that just didn't do that. The love language was doing things for people. Because you had food on the table, you were loved. Because you had one pair of pants to wear, you were loved. That didn't work for me. That did not work for me. And I know that some of you are in places right now that is not working for you. I know there are plenty of you that really don't feel loved here. What that means, I want to talk about that. Let me say a prayer. God, I want to pray on these young people. I pray that you breathe your spirit on them. Uh, I pray you breathe your spirit on me. Help me to speak your words. And I pray that all of our speakers this week will speak from you. And I pray that each one of these young men and young women, and the adults that are in this room as well, that we hear in our own language, that we hear it in a way that we hear you speaking to us the words that we need to hear individually. And I pray these young people will realize their being here is not an accident. Mm -hmm. It's your will that they're here, and you're giving them an opportunity. You're coming near to them, and I pray they'll draw near to you during this week. Help us all to be a blessing on each other, and help us to be blessed. Amen. Amen. In John 15, Jesus <clears throat> is talking here about himself being the vine. And the vine is in this illustration is it's talking about grape vines and they were very familiar with those. Um, but a, but a but a limb on a vine, a branch on a vine is going to die. It's not attached to the vine. That's the sap that comes up. Your number one need, number one need in the world is to feel your worth. Yeah. That's your number one need because you are priceless. It's kind of like any loving parent. Those kids are priceless. Whether they feel worth anything or not, they are. 
they're priceless for those parents. Uh, but if you don't feel it and get it, you're not going to act like it, and you're not going to live like it, and you're not going to have the experience, you're not going to feel worth anything. I know I felt pretty worthless, and so much of the achievement, I've been a classic overachiever in my life, and so much of it was trying to kind of earn my worth, trying to prove myself, say, look, I can do something, I can be something, I can know something. And it didn't work. It did not work, and I can tell you that when I was a sophomore in college, I hit bottom. I would just lay on my bed and look at the ceiling, and I despaired of life. I was a smart enough kid. I was, you know, 18, 19, going on 50. Uh, I had a lot of experiences that God had given me to become great gifts to me at the time. They didn't feel like gifts at all. But nonetheless, it's just starting down this journey of trying to see, you know, something different. To see what is this life worth? Am I worth anything? And how's that measured? And it was my worst year of performance. It was my worst year because I quit working. I made the poorest grades I'd ever made. And for some people, they wouldn't have been too bad. But for me, they were really bad because I had been an overachiever. That's how I found my worth. And I was very driven with it. Those of you that have played basketball with me, uh, people, they joke about me playing so well. You have to know there's a real psychology behind that for me. Uh, when I was young, that was part of proving myself to my family, and I learned to play this rugged, hard basketball, and that's all I know how to play now. But I learned it in a world that there was no mercy, and, you know, if you don't like it, go in the house. Uh, I have been knocked out of bounds, out into the stickers, and if you even cried, you would get in trouble. They just laugh at you. It was the world. It was a, a very hard world. I know your world is different, but it's the same thing. It makes you feel worthless. The one thing, the only thing that will help you realize your worth is getting to know you. That's it. That's it. If you try to find it in your parents, it's going to fail you. Your parents are just like you. Yeah. They're humans and they, we fall short on our best day. And sometimes we're just not there. We're not, we don't know everything. We're not all powerful. We can't do everything. And we're in the same race you are. Well, Jesus is talking here about He's the vine and what the branches get from the vine in the world is love. That's what's going to give you life. That's why he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. A vine separated from me is worthless to be thrown into the fire. But a vine attached to Jesus will find its worth and its own priceless nature before God. What Jesus said in verse 12 is, My command is this, love each other as I love you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. There's no greater love. Let me ask you the question. What would you die for? I mean, just give up your life. Something, somebody that you love or believe in, your loved one. They're dying and you have a chance. They need a heart transplant and you will give them yours. Yours. Who would you do that for? What would you do that for? Would you do it for anybody but you? Most teenagers have not grown to the point that they can truly, completely grapple with that question. But this is the cost of discipleship. And young people, those of us that are the adults, we can't do this for you. We can't stand in the place for you. We can't die in your place for you. That's why we work so hard to get you to listen to us. Listen, listen, listen. But the world is more popular. It's more populous. A lot more people. A lot more glamour. A lot more smoke and mirrors. A lot of lies. Mostly lies. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to compete with that. 
You're going to find your worth in the newest clothes, in the newest look, by being cool, by being hot. You're going to be all something. By getting the right job. That's what it's all about. But you get there and you find out it's no different. The wealthy people that I know, and I know a few that are very successful, they struggle with their self-worth more than most of you would. More. If they've not found Jesus, they've not found anything. When I come to camps like this, and I, I come year after year, I've been doing this for decades, and I love it. I love being here. Because to me, while I know that a year from now, sadly enough, some of you won't be here and you won't be doing well. And you need to know when you're that kid, if we know who you are, we cry over you. We cry over you. Because it hurts us to see people that are apart from Jesus. Because we know what you're chasing. You're chasing this dream that the world is going to make you all something. And it's just nothing but a ruse. It's just nothing but a lie. It's not. It's going to chew you up and spit you out and tell you you're worthless and kick you beside the road. It's all a lie. But Jesus says, here's how you test love. You will say, well, how, how do you know if you died for something? Let me give you a fail-proof test to figure out what you will die for. Look in the mirror of your mind and ask, what do you live for? Yeah. Who do you live for? And most of us, there's one thing we'll die for, and that's me. And I'll die fighting for my life. But there's nobody else's life I'd fight for. See, humans apart from God can't love like that. They just can't love like that. That's why the Greek language has these four kinds of love. You know, phileo or filio love is, is friendship love. You've heard of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. That comes from a Greek word that means love. Brotherly love, it's friendship love. It's when you, when you bond with somebody, there's a commonality. Uh, store gay love is family love. This is this love that you feel for your family. That is, it's uncanny. You may not even like them. You may not be able to stand them. You may can't wait to get away from what you love them. You think, what is this? You call it this love-hate relationship. It's sort of, it's, it's what develops in us as humans when the people that we kind of live with and live around. It's, it's uncanny in the sense that grandkids will recognize through their parents, their grandparents. I watch John and Christie's kids and their love for Larry and Ginger out in San Diego. Wow, where did they get that? They see them once, twice, a year, once in a while. There's lots of other older people around here that they see a lot more. But, but there's, a, there's a love there that it's uncanny. They catch it from their parents. They catch it. They know how much Christy loves her mom and dad and her family. And it's stored and it's powerful. It's overpowering at times. The, 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 the most fleshly human form of love is eros. That's sexual love. That's what you're feeling when you're infatuated with somebody. You go, wow. You know, your mind is just, it's all you think about. Oh my gosh. And that's, that's healthy within itself. That's a gift from God. But the problem is all three of these loves are completely selfish unless yeah. you have God. Yeah, right. Completely. Because agape love is a love of God and it's the love that gives expecting nothing in return. It's a love that does what it is. It is who it is because of who it is. It doesn't matter what anybody else does. And that's what Jesus came to, to, to bring into the world is to show you what that looked like. This love that is not of this world has nothing to do with this world. In fact, it created it and it's embracing it in love, and it, it died for this world to redeem it. In the redemption love. But see, somebody without the love of God can have no other motive but a selfish one. But see, if I have the love of God in my life, it's this X factor out here. Because when I get the love of God, I, I really have gotten what I'm trying to get with all the other loves. Mm -hmm. 
before, before the fact. I got it. Because the love of God says you are priceless. You are priceless at your worst. At your worst. God demonstrated His love for us in that love we were still enemies Christ died for us. He says somebody might dare to die for a righteous person, but very rarely will anyone die for an unrighteous one. There might be some righteous man that would, but very rarely. But God demonstrates it in this way. You were completely unrighteous. He died for you. And so you're priceless. You're priceless on your worst day to God. Now if you can get that, and you can really believe that, if you can get that, and you can really believe that, you have got something that very few people will ever know. Yeah. Jesus said the way to life is narrow. The gate's narrow, the road's narrow. And very few find it. Very few. The statistics ought to be a little better in this room, but sadly enough, in, in the church at large, 25, 75% uh, of the teenagers leave church. Leave church. Now we know of all those teenagers that are in church, there's a good number of them that aren't, aren't with God. That aren't on fire for God. That aren't in love with God. We know that. But we're talking about 75% of the whole group believe and only 25% of the ones that leave ever come back. We're just talking about going to church. We're not talking about having God. We're talking about going and sitting on a pew. And if you've been around the block a little bit, you know there's a whole lot of people that sit on pews that don't got it. They're not getting it. There's no buzz happening for them. The other people are drinking good wine and they're drinking water and they don't realize it. They're not getting a buzz. They don't feel anything. Because it's cheap. That's why Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross every day and follow me. Then he said, whoever wants to save his life, keep it, it's going to lose it. You're going to lose it. You're not going to have this. You keep your life. You can't have you and God. If you're a Christian, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And you can't have it both ways. And you can't fool God. You can play these games. You learn to fool mom and dad really early, right? You learn to keep a straight face. You learn those little deceptions, maybe some lies. You learn that real early. You learn to deceive other people. And you, you, you learn to deceive yourself. I have people all the time, not just teens, college students, adults, come in and they're lying to themselves. They tell me how it is and I'm saying, mm -hmm, it's not that way. They're deceiving themselves. See, you can deceive a lot, but you can't fool God. You cannot fool God. The only fool in that scenario is you. Don't you come to God and try to fool Him. It's disrespectful. It's insulting. And you don't mess around with God. Yes, God is a God of love. But God is the God of the universe. And you don't mess with Him. But as Christians, and a lot of times as Christian teens, we desensitize you so you do. You can play the Christian game. And we'll go to church and we'll come up here and we'll dance and we'll be excited. And we'll go home and it won't be a day before we're not even beginning to keep our commitment. Why don't we talk about when we go home, when we go home, when we go home. Because if, if it doesn't change, then this didn't matter. It was a waste of time. And it may be not only a waste of time, it may be counterproductive because it may desensitize you to the reality of who you are and what you're choosing. But this is why salvation is by faith. If you don't believe in God, you can't attach the bits. And if you don't believe in God, you can't do what it takes because why in the world would you be willing to give your life for your enemies if there's not some other reason? Why? Why would you do that? That's crazy. But that's why Jesus said, this is the work of God. Believe in the one He has sent. Believe in the one He has sent. This is the work. Now while you're, you're at right now, is a part I'm, I'm doing what a dog does in the city. I'm tying myself up here. What you're doing right now, <laughs> watching an old man look like a fool. But, uh, Then I lost my thought. What was I saying? 
<laughs> I'm way off my notes. So. What you're doing up here right now is a part of a vision of something not just different, but extraordinarily different. The church of God ought to be extraordinary. People that are loved this way ought to be extraordinary. Extraordinary. Way out of the ordinary. But guys, when we're in the world, we want to look like the world. We don't want to be extraordinary. We want to look like the world. We work slavishly to impress people. You guys have heard me joke about raising my kids. I would find things to kind of do with each one of them to just kind of get them to get the point. Brianna, it was popularity. She'd gone to new school, and she really wanted to be popular out there. <laughs> Not really. But I know the pull. To try to make friends in school, you've got to do the popularity thing. And if you don't, it'll be counterproductive. You get made fun of. And here's what I would tell her. I said, sweetheart, you need to know all that matters today is for you to be popular. <laughs> People go find the biggest, dumbest looking guy and impress him. If you impress him, that would be a great standard for you to go by. Or the ditziest girl that everybody's chasing, go impress her. Because that will tell you when you really made it. And of course, she'd roll her eyes. It's silly. But it goes on every day in your school. It's exactly what's going on. We're trying to impress people at one. What do you get for that? When you graduate, most of them you'll never even think about again, let alone see them. And you're going to shape your life around people that they're just as sad as you are? Why? Well, our vision is for you to have something to, to build from the ground up. That's why we've got over 50 adults here with you. And I'm not just talking about adults. I know these people. They're some of the finest Christians I've ever known. And they've taken a week off to come up here, listen to me, to die for you. That's all it's about. It's about us. Heck, if we're going to take a week off, we're just going to have a little vacation, not mess with you. But they're in a place this is what they want to do. Because they want to communicate your worth to you. You're the newest visitor. You're the quietest kid. You're, you're, you're the kid that thinks nobody likes you. We love you the most. We care about you the most. You just let us know you need more love and we will pour it on you. But it's not just about building a nice team. We're not just trying to have a nice team camp so we can go home and tell how we got saved. How fun it was. We want people to get saved and we want you to enjoy yourself. But we're trying to build an army of people that get it. They get the kingdom DNA. And wherever you go or whatever you do, you got it. And you don't need the world's junk anymore. Sir. The world doesn't own you anymore. You don't love this world anymore. The world can't manipulate you and prostitute you to itself and then kick you in the gutter. That's not how God feels about you. Greater love has no one. What, what, what are you willing to die for? What do you live for? You don't have fun? Impress your parents? You just live to get out of school? Sadly, that's about how deeply most of us think. But to be extraordinary, guys, you can't be like everybody else and not think about it. We're challenging you to think about it. I heard an axiom years ago that said teenagers will live down their expectations of them. And so I quit expecting all stuff out of teenagers. If you want to be a disciple, be a disciple. Step up. There were kings that led Israel when they were teenagers. I kept a whole house when I was 17, drove a school bus, drove it on school trips when I was 17. I mean, kept the whole house. The whole house. Cook, shop, paid the bills. I worked. My money went into my dad's checking account. Would you think you could do that? Would you like to do that? Cook every meal? Literally, dad would not cook anything. He wouldn't even get his own coffee. When I was home, I had to go get his coffee and take it to him. Oh, you can do a whole lot more than you think you can. But you know what? 
I can look back now, I'm, I'm, I would re much rather have the life I lived than the life most of you live. I really would. Most of you that grow up in comfort, you're just lost in the world. The world's got you. Some of you, sports is your God. Some of you, cheer for you, maybe. We all love sports here. We, we, we have the cheer coaches here. We, that's just what it is. We're going to play basketball. After her worst game and she just saw the press, I'd go and whisper in her sweetheart, it's just a game. It doesn't even matter. She didn't want to hear that at the time. And she knows what it meant now. And she thanked me for telling her that. Well, that's what I'm telling you. It's just that. That's just sports. You live for that, you're going to be a sad, sad soul. Mm -hmm. You live for academics. You live for your family. We're, we, we, we don't just want to have one of these camps. We'd love to have 20 of these camps this summer. 2020 vision was to plant 50 churches in the Dallas Metroplex in 20 years. I, I know we got could do that. I knew that was ridiculous. But we have planted four in like seven campus ministries. Who would have thought a little group of people out of a little regional church that didn't have any money in Garland could do that? How many other churches are doing campus ministry? How many others can boast the kind of people we boast in this room? Guys, this is a vision. We were praying this when Jordan and Emily and Maddie were born. We prayed for them. That they would grow up. They were our first babies in our church in the They were the first ones. Build from the ground up. I know some of you, we need to get started on you. But we're going to start on you now. Mm -hmm. And you're going to hear this all week long. I don't know what God has in the script for you. We're not trying to claim Him. We're not that church. We're not trying to recruit people. We're not trying to have more people than other people. We would rather have 10 disciples and 10,000 lukewarmers. That's that. So when we get a bunch of lukewarmers, they try to make our church lukewarm, and we end up having to fight and leave. Well, so be it. We're going to fight for a vision. We're trying to build an army of young people that really are what you guys are saying. You really are. Really are so that, and that's not easy to get there. Right. It's not easy to get there. Way of life is hard, mm -hmm. and those who find it are few because most people are not willing to die. They don't believe enough to die. Philippians 1 9 to, to 11. More, it's not just about getting, it's about getting more. But again, remember where I was talking about if you don't have the love of God that all of these other loves are selfish. If you don't have the love of God, your friendships are selfish. That's why you treat your friend nice, they don't treat you nice, what do you do? You ditch them. You get mad at them. Maybe talk about them. You get them back. That's just selfish friendship. That's cheap. That's worldly. That tells about your character is not growing in the character of God. God doesn't do that. God is about the other. Yeah. Love one another as I have loved you. That's what this vision is about. We want we a want hundred churches around the Metroplex. We want a campus ministry on every campus in the Metroplex so that we can then begin to do some big things. We don't want one church of 25,000. We want a hundred churches of 250. With young people that have grown up that didn't leave God, that doesn't come back in limping with a bunch of immoral baggage and junk in their life, that have invested like so many of the college kids have here. That during their college years, they went from this ministry, they went to a ministry, and they continue to invest in the kingdom. And then they come back out, and that's who Kelly and Jamie are. That's who Joseph and Brittany are. That's who Bray and Ty are. That's who Jeff and Stephanie are. They're people that served God and built and continue to build. They come out and they take over ministry. Virtually every ministry in Northeast is led by an ex-focus person. But what are we doing that? To make a name for ourselves? No. Most focus people, that's Fellowship of Christian University Students. For those of you that are new, that's our, what we call our campus ministry. Most of them don't go to our churches. The vast majority don't. We still counsel them. We still love them. We still invest in them. Because that's a kingdom deal. But, but plenty come back. 
And that's the vision I want you to get. We don't want just one little youth ministry that's close to heaven. We want, we want to build DNA into a youth ministry that's sold out young people because you can do a heck of a lot more than you want anybody else to think you can do. You can run households. You can work the farm. You can teach the gospel. You can rock the world. You give me one man sold out to God and you can blow the world away. So you've heard that one before, haven't you? And you can. David was a little guy when he blew the world away. And he defied this giant and this army that was 20 million people. Oh, you, know, you can't. But you can't if you're not willing to trust God. You can't. You can't do this on your own. You can't have this kind of luck. You're going to be a selfish, big baby. It's going to be about you. It's going to be about you and your friendships. It's going to be about you and your family. You're going to go home. You're going to be lazy, selfish, self-willed, worried all about yourself. Person. When you, get, when you get in a relationship, when you date, it's going to be about you. You're going to want the cutest, the best, the most popular. You're going to want them to treat you right and do everything right and be this and be that and be cool and yada, yada, yada. You get married, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to be a selfish baby and you can mask it with everything. You can fool you, you can fool me, you can fool other people, but you can't fool God. And you need to see that who you are is who God sees. If you're a liar, God sees it. If you're sneaky and you're deceitful, if you're holding sin in your life, if you're angry and resentful, if you're selfish, God, that's who God sees. Now in Christ, He covers it over. So He sees you as holy and blameless. But that still doesn't make you not a selfish baby. You're still a selfish baby. God frees you from your sin so you can work on stopping being a selfish baby. So you can stop being weak and fearful and afraid to do stuff. You can do hard things and you've got to believe it. Because you can, but the world wants you to think you can. It wants you to sit on the sidelines. It wants to use you up. And then when you're about 25, you come back in. And even if you approach God, you've got so much baggage and so much damage in your life. You're neutralized before you even start the race. Or... You can come on and get on board with us. You can go to a nice church. There are plenty of nice churches. I'm not making a judgment at all. But I can tell you most churches don't have a dynamic vision. Their vision is saving people and getting better. And that's not what Jesus wants for you. I want to invite you into a much bigger vision than having a great time this week and going on people there. I want to invite you to a kingdom vision. Jesus is Lord. And when Jesus is Lord, it really doesn't matter so much who our president is. Yeah. It really doesn't matter too much what the Supreme Court rules on or what the world thinks about something. It just really doesn't matter. We care to the extent we need to minister to it. But what matters is what Jesus thinks. Yeah. And if you'll get that, you'll get this love. And if you get this love, you'll find freedom from the world. Because that's the way the world can You young ladies that are insecure. You feel worthless. Some guy can lead you down the rosy path because you're just so thrilled that some little girl likes you. You guys saying some little girl like you. Oh. If they don't know the love of God, that's worthless. Sure. And it's worth and worthless. Yeah. It'll damage you. That's why we that's why we preach stuff that you don't like. We talk about that. We know you don't like hearing it. We wouldn't have liked hearing it either. But it's still the right thing because we're telling you words of life, words of truth. Because we don't want you doing that. We don't want you feeling cheap and you're having to prove yourself to the world and even to the worldly among us. See, here's Paul's prayer for you. I, this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best. When it comes to God, we don't just want more. We want the best, the most, the best. But how many of you can say you've given your best to anything? Well, I know it's hard for all of us. But most of us don't have that mentality. We want to conserve our stuff. We don't want to give the most. We want to give the least. We get in friendships, we give the least. It's quid pro quo, to use a Latin term. Tit for tat. 
I'm going to give to you and then I expect you to give back to me. And then I give back to you and you give back to me. I give to you, you don't give back to me, I'm mad. What are you doing? Why are you texting me? Why do you call me? And if you don't, then I just say, well, I'll show you. I'm not going to text you. And then when you call, I'm going to take your call. You know what I'm saying? Well, they never call me. They never do. They never. That's not this. That's this selfish play. It's self-centered. It's worthless. Yeah. Because it's world. It's satanic. But guys, that's what most of you experience. That's what most of you do with each other right now. I'm, you're trying to be that way. This takes a lot of maturity. You can't do this just by your will. Yeah. Paul said, I can will what's right, but I can't do it. You can't do your best on your own. The only way you can do that is with the Holy Spirit in you that you get from God. This love that He pours out from us in the Holy Spirit that frees us from the world. The world can't control us. We used to sing verses from the Lord. One of the, 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 the verses was, This love of mine, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. This love of mine, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. This love of mine, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. The world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. That's freedom. Mm -hmm. If you can get that, you find freedom. Because you're going to find the things the world can't take away. That's why Jesus said, no one will snatch you out of my hands. There's nobody powerful enough to do that. But He's given you the freedom when He called you to choose Him. But He's not even going to call you if your heart's not right. He won't even give you a chance for the common Christian. That your love may be on the Lord. What does that look like? What is some of that we're going to talk about. What does that look like when your love abounds more and more? Another verse, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10. Now about brotherly love, this is the word phileo. About brotherly love we do not need to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. See, that's what Jesus taught. But it's phileo from God. Love one another as I have loved you. Which is this perfectly unselfish love that Jesus phileos us with. It's about us, not about Him. See, you've been taught by God and in fact you, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you brothers to do so more and more. That's the thing about a God they love. Because it comes from God, it can't be sized. It has no limits. It's an infinite love. It can just grow. The more you grow in the Lord, the more you grow in agape. The more you grow in agape, the more you can grow in the I maintain, I don't know how many friendships around the world. True, best friend kind of friendship. I learned that from God. I have got some of the best friends that I've ever seen. Anybody else have? I have more best friends than anybody I know. I'm not boasting in myself. I'm boasting in the Lord. You can't out give God. I just wanted real friends. I was that kid that wanted authenticity. And I didn't ever feel like anybody loved me until I met people that loved God. Mm -hmm. And for the sure. first time, I felt the love of God for people. See, do it more and more. Too many times we're satisfied with a little greeting. <laughs> really? That's the best love you've got? You know, you know what I'm saying? Guys, we want to free you from this hang-up. We're so afraid somebody's going to think of Why do you care what they think? Why do you care? Well, I know why you care. We all know why you care. We all experience it. But the question we each have to answer, why do we care? Yeah. Why do we care what people that are unfriendly, ungrateful, yeah. ugly spirited. Why do we care what they think? Yeah. And why do we try to please those people? As if you can please them. You're not going to please them because they're just like you when they're that way. They're trying to get what you're trying to get and both of you are bankrupt. Sure. Nobody's got any. But when you've got the love of God, you've got something to give to people. 
It's real. It's the Holy Spirit. You can just love people. It'll pour from you. Out of their hearts will gush rivers of living water. And you know it's not from you. Yeah. You just know it and you don't take credit for it. And you just feel so free. Because you don't have to generate it. You just have to give it. It's just you you spend it, your bank account, it's put in there more, you got more. You'll always give it more. You will never go bankrupt with God. You will never go bankrupt with the love of God. The more you love, the more you can love. The more people you love, the more people you can love. I do counseling sessions from people all over the place. I've done two from Colorado in the last two weeks that people have referred to me, calling me early in the morning and saying, so-and-so told me to call you because you would. And, and then hang out, just so thankful. Because what they really needed more than anything somebody to want to do. Yeah. To show the love of God and to free them. So much of counseling, that's what it is. 1 Peter 4 a. Listen to this. Above all. Above all. You know what that means in the Greek? Literally? Anybody know Greek? John, you know the Greek word. What it means, What's it mean? It means above all. It means above all. That's exactly what it means. It means above all. Now what does above all mean? It means above all. It's above everything. When something's above all, it's a big deal. See, above all, love each other deeply. Feel it in your gut. Feel it in your bones. Love each other deep. You see, we're afraid to do that because love costs us something. You love people like that. They're liable to ask you for something. And if they do, you're liable to do it. Well, that's the truth. I could tell you story after story after story of people calling me that I love dearly, asking me to do things that I don't want to do. They don't deserve having done for them. They're being inconsiderate and selfish, but I, in the name of God, I'm going to love them. And I'm going to do what I think is best for them. But it costs you something. You have more people call you. You have more people expect something out of them. You have more people that want some of you. This is a big deal. But it covers a multitude of sins. I could get by with a whole lot of stuff with John. John and I have been together for close to 17 and a half years now. We live next door to each other. I adopted him as my son in the faith from the beginning. We spent hundreds and hundreds of hours together. Um, I could get by with a lot with John. And John could get by with a lot with me. I couldn't get by with anything that wouldn't hurt him. The first ugly thing I did was cut him deeply. That's what he would do. When you love deeply, you, you open your heart up and they can hurt you. But that kind of love covers over a multitude of sins. Yeah. It's that kind of love that, that you, you give people grace because you know they love you and you know they're trying. You give them the best. But the other, there's not any. Above all, love each other deeply. That's the way God has loved you. This takes a personal vision. Who do you want to be? You want to be cool? You want to be popular? You want the world to say you're hot? You're, you're awesome? As if that matters? Well, what's it going to tell you if the whole world thinks you're awesome? It's going to tell you unequivocally that you're not. Yeah. That's all you can know when the world loves you is you think you're awesome, you're not. But you've got to have a vision for something else. What's your vision? Is it limited? Is your vision that, look, I can just come to church and I'll come most of the time and, you know, I can still do this and that and I can still and I can have Jesus and I can have the group. And, is that your vision? Mediocrity, is that your vision? Hypocrisy, is that your vision? Because I'm telling you right now, some of you, that's exactly what your vision is. That's exactly, you know, where'd you get it? I know where you got it. Same place I got it. 
Same place Tammy got it. The world gave it to us. It told us we were worthless. We couldn't do anything. Our life wouldn't matter. You can't do that. That's the accuser. But Jesus can, is telling you, you can do all things through me. Paul said, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. But you've got to be strengthened by the love of Jesus. You yeah. can't just fabricate this. I'm going to be all awesome for now. It's not going to happen that way. You go get close to Jesus and you'll be awesome for God. Get real close to Him. And every time you learn something new, do it the best of your ability. Don't you let anybody embarrass you. Just go do it. When I introduced hugging among the guys in our community years ago, you think they all like that? First time I gave them a kiss on the cheek or on the neck, you think they liked that? First time I hugged some little girl's side and I kissed you on the forehead, you think that wasn't weird? We have to learn to love yeah. and love appropriately. Yeah. The love of God. Well, I decided a long time ago, I don't care what the world thinks. I don't care. I know what the world thinks, and therefore I don't care because they're lost. They're in darkness. They just don't know. They need to know what we know in Christ. Why in the world would we worry about pleasing them? Why in the world would we worry about what they think? Yeah. Girls, you try to impress the world, the message is going to be really clear. You're worthless. You're worth only how cute you can be today. Guys, it's the same way. You go try to get it from being a cool guy, being popular, being studly, being a great athlete. You're gonna, you're gonna, it's gonna be as good as your last play, your last deal. Yeah. And when they find somebody better, they'll kick you aside. Yeah. It's just worldly. It can't give it because it don't got it. Why would we do that? I want you to have a vision for you, a personal commitment to God. That supersedes anything. Don't, don't let your parents be your ceiling. Outgrow them. You ought to be standing on the shoulders of your parents. Yeah. Take what they've given you and then take it higher. Yeah. I'm trying to leave a church that John and the other leaders can take higher. I don't want to start where I started. I don't want them to have to dig out of a hole and start building the kingdom. I want to, I want to grow out of that hole and leave a foundation that can be built on that can go forward, that can go high, can get bigger. That's founded on one thing, and that's Jesus is Lord. It's a kingdom. And that's all that matters. Jesus is Lord. And we're one with anybody that's that. If Jesus is your Lord, then you're my brother or sister, baby. Let's get on with it. If you're not, well, I invite you to come and be back. You've got to have a vision for the kingdom. You've got to have a vision for yourself. And then you've got to have a plan. One of the things you're going to hear a whole lot about this week is planning for going home. Because just like God through these people set this up to bless you in phenomenal ways this week, it's a setup. It's a kingdom setup. It's a trap. To get you to come so we can talk to you just like this. And you're going to hear person after person plead with you. Mm -hmm. Be reconciled to God. Get this. Get this now before the world can corrupt you and mess you up and cripple you and hold you back and hobble you for years to come. Get it now. They're going to be begging you. It's a setup. God led us to do this. God led us. This vision is from a direct vision from God, guys. This wasn't something I've dreamed of. It's not even something I felt like I could do. It's a vision from God, and He's, he's given other people vision. He gave John a vision when he came into Grandy's on that morning, really before he knew what was going on, and said, I feel like I know what God wants me to be. And I said, what's that? And he said, a missionary. That was a vision from God. Well, he had already told me what his vision for John was. John, yeah, he wants you to be our first youth minister. That's going to be your mission. John. And that's where all this started, was, was with the foundation. But you've got to have a plan going home because there is a big old rat trap set for you. Yeah. When you get off the bus, it's called the world. Maybe your parents, maybe they're depressed, maybe they're down. 
Maybe they're worried about you getting in a cult or you doing something stupid. You know, they, they love you. You get their very best. Maybe your brother or sister, maybe that friend. You're not going to become one of those goody two shoe Christians, are you, on me? You know how that can do? Just cut your legs out from under you, doesn't, doesn't it? If you're not ready for it, there's a big old rat trap waiting on you. And if you don't have a plan, you will end up in it. And two months from now, you'll be off in a hole, and all of this will be wasted. It will be a memory, and it will be one more thing you look back and think, I failed. I failed. You need a plan, and you need to be strong in the people. You need to be attached. That's why we have a youth group, guys. We're, we're not just trying to count attendance. The reason we want you in attendance is so we can minister to you, so we can strengthen you. We can't help you if we can't get to you. We can't strengthen you with a group. Well, there's a group if we can't have you together. What kind of football team would be any good if they met once a week and half the group didn't show up because they had something else they wanted to do? We can't get good doing that. You know, if, if the world is more important to you, then this is what we've got. And too often the youth ministers get the second youth. They get seconds. We can't build great youth ministries because we're too busy putting other things first. Other things that are perfectly okay. But they're not God's. This is God. And that's the challenge we want you to have. I want you to look at what is your greatest devotion right now and what you want it to be. And you need to chart, of course, how are you going to get there? How do you, what, do you, what do you do with your time at home? That will tell you where your devotion is. Is it video games? Your, your devotion is to live in fantasy? Mm -hmm. You're still living like a two-year-old in fantasy? That's it? I think video games are fine. I think a little bit of it. I think sports are fine. But if you think you're all something because you can dunk a basketball, man, the world has really done a job on you. And there's a lot of people, and they'll pay you big money if you're good at it, doing its foolish things. You know? Who do you like? Who do you love? Who do you respect? I hope that you can look in this pain ministry of yours and see people that are devoted to God. Not because they're cool about the world, but they love God. Who are your friends? I'll tell you the biggest predictor of what you're doing. I don't need to know you. To know who you are and what you're doing. All I need to know is who your friends are. That's all I need to know. Because you are who your friends are. Greater love has no one in it. You want to be you want to be that kind of person with that? That's strong enough to die for somebody else? That's strong enough to die, literally die. But more than that, to live for what they would die for. Live for what you would die for. And what's worth living. Guys, thank you a lot. Love you guys. You're awesome.